Okay, welcome to Great Jewish Personalities. Today's Great Personality rises to fantastic prominence during and after the Hadrianic persecutions. Hadrian became emperor of Rome in 117, and he instituted terrible, crippling decrees on the Jewish people. He forbade the practice of Nida, of circumcision, of Shabbos. Uh, he forbade public teaching of Torah. He said if any child gets circumcised, they should... The, the child and the mother will get killed. Uh, he destroyed Jerusalem and rebuilt it as a pagan city. Uh, he built a temple, an altar, to a pagan deity on Temple Mount. And he also banned Jews from entering Jerusalem and the temple. This led to the most successful of all revolts in Roman history. Of course, this is the Bar Kokhba Rebellion. It was a horrible, bloody, and brutal war that lasted a long time. And it was led by the enigmatic Shimon Bar Kokhba, otherwise known as Bar Koziva, a man of tremendous physical strength and a great scholar. And initially the war went very, very well for, for the Jews. And they were really successful in capturing Jerusalem, and they minted coins, and they reestablished sovereignty. And Rabbi Akiva was actually convinced that Shimon Bar Kokhba is the Messiah, and they're going to go back to Jerusalem, rebuild the temple, everything was going to be wonderful. Unfortunately, it didn't go as planned. The Romans quelled the rebellion with absolute brutality, as they always do. Uh, he sent his greatest general, who was in Britain at the time, Julius Severus, to repel the revolt. They recaptured Jerusalem. They forced the forces of Bar Kokhba to retreat. They ended up fortifying themselves in the city of Betar, the ancient city of Betar. They survived in uh, hold up in Betar for a long time. Uh, but the fortress of Betar was breached and it was betrayed and the war ended with absolute disaster and devastation. According to both Jewish and Roman sources, we're talking about a million Jews dead, which in those times, the way to kill someone, you, you, there's no, you, cannot, uh, you cannot outsource that to Zyklon B gas. You have to do it all by hand and one, really terrible, really absolute slaughter. But to make things even worse, after the war there was a very intense, almost Holocaust-like, what's known as a shmad, terrible, brutal treatment of the Jewish people by Hadrian for a couple of years. He recognized that Torah was really the thing, the entity that kept the Jews alive. And it's interesting, like a lot of Jewish antagonists, they actually recognize what it is that, what it is that makes us special. And he knew that if we get rid of the rabbis and get rid of the Torah and you ban and abolish all Jewish practice, it's very likely you'll, you'll you know, once and for all destroy the Jewish people. So one of the greatest periods of suffering in the history of the Jewish people happened right after that terrible war. Men were slaughtered, women were slaughtered, communities, entire communities were to suffer terrible deaths in horrible, gruesome manners. Anyone observed any precept of the Torah, they were put to death. And of course, the rabbis and the Torah leadership suffered the worst. And this is an interesting point and juncture in history. The temple's been destroyed now for 60 or so years, basically. And the bastion of stability, which is the rabbis and the Torah, all that was being compromised. Uh, and we, we, we really find a, a period of heroism of determination, of martyrdom for rebuilding Torah at this point more than almost any other time in history. Because the Romans were systematically eliminating all the rabbis, all uh, members of the Sanhedrin, all people who taught Torah publicly were all being executed everywhere. And we find at this point a small cadre of students that really under, young students who undertook the effort to preserve and perpetuate Torah. Rabbi Tiva, we spoke about it last week. He was initially imprisoned, then he was killed. We'll meet in our story some more of the rabbis that were executed in horrible, horrific ways. Uh, mm -hmm. He banned any form of public Torah study, like we said. And crucially, also, he banned the conference of smicha. Smicha is a critical office in Jewish life, especially when the Sanhedrin was around. Sanhedrin was an official, organized body of leadership for the people. But in order to be a member of the Sanhedrin, you had to be a rabbi. You have to have smicha. And you only get smicha from someone who got smicha, from someone who got smicha, all the way back to Moses. So the Romans recognized if you just stop smicha, then you stop the Sanhedrin and you disrupt the Jewish people entirely. 
So they banned that as well. And it's also critical because at this juncture, at this point in time, the oral Torah and the mission of the Talmud, all that was still being conveyed orally, teacher to student, parent to child. So the rabbis were essentially the, the standard bearers of Torah because they were the one, they, they, it was all in their heads. There was no way to take it and convey it and, and to hide it somewhere to preserve it. If you kill off the rabbis and kill off the Torah and there's no public teaching of Torah, that's it. The Jewish people are done. So we're told in the Talmud, Rabbi Tiva had 24,000 students and they died at this period. Now why is that they died? It's a little bit unclear. The Talmud said that they died because they didn't treat each other properly. But we know that it, it does coincide with this point in history. So many have theorized that they didn't die in a supernatural plague, they died in a plague uh, in the war and in the aftermath of the war. And all we had left were five students. And these five students created essentially the Judaism we have today because they were the only ones really that started from the bottom with, with the entire infrastructure of Jewish leadership being sent uh, either underground or to execution and the numbers of rabbis being swiftly diminished. We find these five students playing very critical roles in teaching Torah uh, to the future generations. Who are these students? Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Shimon, known as Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai, and Rabbi Alazar ben Shemua. This, these cadre of students, some of the greatest Jewish leaders we've ever seen. And particularly, they were great in, they were great in their uncompromising commitment and dedication to Torah study and with their keen understanding that the only way to ensure survival from thenceforth would be to bolster Torah. So what's the first order of business? They had to get smicha. So what happened with these students? There was one ancient sage by the name of Yehuda ben Baba. And he understood the f- terrible problem they were facing. Problem was, is that if he was to give smicha, not only would he get executed for giving smicha, all the young rabbis that he would give smicha to would also be executed. And in the city in which the ordination was conferred, the entire city would be wiped away. That was the way the Romans did. It was, you know, it was the collateral damage all across. So he took these five students and he went between two cities so in, in where no one could see, and it wasn't in any city, so no city could be blamed for it. And he quickly gave them smicha, the same five students that we mentioned, and perhaps there was a sixth student in both of these stories. And unfortunately, there were people that had told the authorities about it, and as he's giving them smicha, the authorities are approaching from all sides. He tells the, he tells the students, run away, hide yourself, and I'll have to deal with whatever comes. The Romans come on him and they absolutely kill him in a horrible, brutal way. They threw spears at him and the Talmud says that they made him into a net. They just riddled him with, with injuries and causing him to die in that horrible way. But these students now, they're the last remaining students of Rabbi Tiva. They finally have smicha secured and they begin to lay the groundwork of writing the oral Torah. How'd they do that? They essentially took Torah, the five books of Moses, they divided it up amongst them, and they said, okay, you write down all the oral Torah that you remember from Exodus, and then you do all it from Leviticus and Deuteronomy, Numbers, and these are the books that are the groundwork of the oral Torah. Says the Talmud in Sanhedrin 86a, an anonymous Mishnah, if there's no name for a Mishnah, who's that? That's Rameer, Rameer undertook to write down the Mishnah. An anonymous Tosefta, which is another aspect of oral Torah, Rabbi Nehemiah. Anonymous Sifra, Rabbi Huda. Anonymous Sifri, Rabbi Shimon. And all of them, because they're all students of Rabbi Tiva, are all going with his methodology, his approach. Today, I would like to take a close look at one of the students, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai, also known simply as Rabbi Shimon. Uh, he was a legend, a uh, striking persona, a scholar, and a tremendous visionary. And also someone who did miracles like it was totally second nature. It's really a remarkable uh, personality. And the stories about him are, uh, you don't hear these kinds of stories. And it's also a little bit frightening, a little bit of a frightening uh, personality. He was a student of Rabbi Akiva, like we mentioned. Uh, He is one of the most frequently mentioned rabbi in Talmud and Mishnah. According to someone who did the calculation, he's the fourth most mentioned opinion. And he studied with Rabbi Tiva with tremendous dedication. Even when Rabbi Tiva was incarcerated, he was imprisoned. The Talmud tells that Rabbi Tiva, that Shreve Shimon Bar Yechai was able to visit him. 
He went to visit him and he says, okay, Rebbe, teach me Torah. He's surrounded by Roman guards. And what the rule is, you teach Torah publicly, you get executed. Rebbe Kiva says, I'm not teaching you Torah. He says, oh, if you don't teach me Torah, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to tell the Romans about you. Kind of gave him this empty threat, but he's like, teach me, I need it. And Rabbi Kiva responds to him, he says, more than the calf wants to eat, the mother wants to feed. He says, I, I, I want to teach you Torah more than you want to study Torah. Rabbi Shimon responded, wait a minute, you're already in prison. You have nothing to lose. Nothing worse can happen to you. I'm, I'm a free man, so I have something to lose, and I'm willing to take it upon myself, the risk, if you teach me Torah. The Rabbi Kiva responds with very famous words. This is from the Talmud in Sachim 1.12. He says, if you want to hang yourself, you'll have to find a taller tree, i.e., I'm not teaching you Torah. But this really shows a little bit about his obsession. He had an obsession with Torah study, and not only that, he was not willing to compromise in any way, unbending, not willing to pander to the Romans, as we'll see, but also a person with total solitary focus on Torah. All he wanted was to study Torah, and we'll see it demonstrated in, his, in the stories that we'll tell about him, and also about the lessons that he would frequently teach. For example, the, the Mishnah in Chapters of the Fathers quotes him as follows. This is from the Mishnah, Chapters of the Fathers, Chapter 3, Mishnah 7. Rabbi Shimon says, someone who's walking along the way and studying Torah, and he stops, and he says, look at this tree that the Almighty made. Isn't it a beautiful tree? Behold, this is someone who is endangering his life. In, Rab- in Rabbi Shimon's view, Torah study is literally like giving yourself spiritual oxygen. You can't stop it for nothing. If you want to say, oh, look at the wonderf- wonderful world that Hashem made. And that's a mitzvah, by the way. It's a mitzvah. That's, a, what the, that's the mitzvah of loving God. To appreciate what God did for us. But if you stop Torah for anything, you're a dead man. You're essentially a dead man from a spiritual perspective. And that a little, shows a little bit of his feisty personality. He, he was someone that had very little tolerance, in fact, almost no tolerance for anything that was not Torah and not holiness. Uh, and especially at this time, they had an appreciation that Torah may be going extinct. If you look at the progression of events, it's likely that Torah would have gone extinct. And he had a tenacious perspective, and he said this, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that, God forbid, Torah should not be forgotten. It was truly an existential threat to the continuity of the Jewish people, and therefore he took it upon himself, him amongst his colleagues, to ensure that Torah will not be forgotten from the Jewish people. There's a famous debate that he had with one of the rabbis, and the debate is based upon verses in the Torah. There's two verses that seem to be in conflict. We read in the Shema, we read the verse, and you shall gather your grain. Vasafta de ganer, you gather your grain. When it says you gather your grain, obviously it's implied that you have a job, you're a farmer, and you work the field, you plant it, you plowed, etc., and now you're gathering your grain. But this implies that you're a farmer. However, there's another verse that says, the books of the Torah shall never cease from you, which seems to imply, to the contrary, that Torah is the only thing that you should have. You shouldn't stop Torah for anything, certainly not for being a farmer. So how do you reconcile these two verses? That's the question that the Talmud brings up in Brachos. So first it brings the opinion of Rabbi Yishmael. Rabbi Yishmael says, listen, you have to be very pragmatic. If someone just studies Torah, who's going to feed their family? They'll starve. So you have to study Torah, but you also have to make time to make a living. You have to find a way to do both. That's what Rabbi Yishmael says, a very pragmatic approach. Comes on Rabbi Shimon, he says like this. Rabbi Shimon, the son of Yechai, said, if a person plows during the time of plowing, and plants during the season of planting, and harvests during the harvest season, and grinds in grinding season, and winnows during the times of the wind, what will become of the Torah? Torah, ma Rather, what's his solution? When Israel is doing the will of God, their work will be done by others. You study Torah all the time. And don't worry about it. The Almighty will take care of you. But when Israel is not doing the will of the Almighty, then the work will be done by you, and additionally the work of others will be done by you as well. Rabbi Shimon says like this, when the verse says the words of Torah should never cease, that's the way it ought to be ideally. And if you do that, you study Torah literally all the time, 
The money will feed you. Don't worry about it. Leave it to him. When it says you gather your grain, that's referring to when it's not optimal. You're only working because you're not doing the will of the Almighty, and then therefore you have to do your work and God will not provide. This really shows that his perspective was only Torah and reliance on God. God will, God will, God will feed you. And particularly after the assassinations of the various rabbis, Rabbi Shimon and his colleagues were very concerned what's going to be with the Torah. Now, after this time, there was informers everywhere. Like any, like any, any bad word, it's almost like the Soviet Union. If you say anything bad, it'll get to the authorities, and people were having walls had ears. So there's once a discussion between three rabbis, Rabbi Huda, Rabbi Yosef, and Rabbi Shimon, three of these five rabbis. They were talking, and there was someone else overhearing. He was listening in. He was eavesdropping. And they started talking about the Romans. And Rabbi Huda says, these Romans, they're good people. They built such big builders. They built bridges, and they established bathhouses, marketplaces. They did such wonderful things. That's what Rabbi Huda says. Rabbi Yossi says he, he didn't hear enough quiet. He didn't get involved. And Rabbi Shimon says like this, no, everything they did, they did for themselves. There was no altruism at all in their behavior. They're not good people at all. Well, what they do? When they established marketplaces, that was only so they could make uh, harlot houses along those marketplaces. When they built bathhouses, it was only to delight themselves. And when they built bridges, it was just to collect taxes. Rabbi Shimon, as we'll see through the rest of the stories, he was fundamentally incompatible with evil. When he saw something that was evil, that was wrong, he called it out. And he wasn't scared. He says, the Romans are evil, they're bad, they're bad people, they're a bad country, everything they do is for selfish reasons, and I don't care, that's, 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 that's the truth, and I'll stand for the truth. He did not allow evil to exist in his presence. So what happened? The guy who was overhearing, he went and ran and told the authorities. So the authorities said, okay, we have three rabbis. One of them spoke well about the Romans. He is the head of the yeshiva. And the one who was quiet, he's not good nor bad. He didn't say anything about good or bad. He is going to have to be exiled. And Rabbi Shimon, who spoke negatively, he's going to be executed. Rabbi Shimon hears what's happening, and he hides. And he's hiding in various places, and he's worried what's going to be. How is he going to eat? His wife brings him food, but what if she gets caught and she gets interrogated and tortured? What, what if she reveals the place? He decides to run to the hills, and he runs and he hides in a cave. And during this cave is where his life really takes on a new meaning. What does he do? He's there with his son. His son was also one of the great rabbis at the time. His name was Rabbi Yezer. And they run, and they're in a cave in the middle of nowhere. The cave, there's no food, there's nothing to drink. It's barren and desolate. He says, I'm in the cave. I'm relying on God. I'm going to study Torah. They are in the cave. The next morning, they wake up. There's a miracle. This is the first miracle we meet about Rabbi Shimon. There's many more remarkable stories. Outside, a carob tree sprouted, and a spring of water started to stream right next to them. And they had food, and they had to eat. The problem was they only had one set of clothing. So they dug these holes into the ground, took off their clothing, they covered themselves all up to their head in sand, and they studied Torah. And on Shabbos, they put their clothes on. And every, 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 you know, every once in a while, they go for a snack, get some carbs, get some water, go back to Torah study. How long were they there for? For 12 years. 12 years later, in the rest of the world, there's turnover in the Roman community. There's a new emperor and some, and the order to go execute Rabbi Shimon, that gets rescinded. And Elijah the prophet comes to inform Rabbi Shimon that he's free to go. So he starts calling out in the middle of this wilderness, oh, the Romans, they're not seeking out Rabbi Shimon. Who's going to tell Rabbi Shimon? Rabbi Shimon hears this. He realizes he's free to go. And him and his sons, go out of the cave and go to, into the world like regular people. Now, during this time period in the cave, according to Jewish tradition, he wrote the Zohar. The Zohar is a book, the foundational book of Jewish mysticism. And we'll see Rabbi Shimon as someone who is very much steeped in that, in the depths, in the most mystical, deep understanding of Torah. And 
he emerges in the world and he's spent 12 years totally immersed in Torah study and he goes into the world and he is totally dumbstruck with what he sees. He sees people working, people not studying Torah, people forgetting about what's important in life. He, he cannot believe what he sees. So the Gemara tells us, this is the Gemara on Shabbos. He went outside and he saw people that were planting. He says, I can't believe it. These people are, are forgetting about the eternal life and they're dealing with a temporary life. Every place the Rabbi Shimon and his sons looked, just their eyes looked, it came up in fire. They started destroying places. Like they, they had such power to them, such spiritual power that was incompatible with anything that wasn't Torah that they, it just burned up in his presence. So the look, everywhere they're looking, the whole place becomes a, a flaming inferno. They hear a prophetic announcement. Wait a minute. Shimon and your son Eliezer, you came out to destroy my world. Get back to your cave. They go back to their cave. They settle down in the cave again for the 12 months. After 12 months, Rabbi Shimon says that we know that in Gehenna, if an if a evil person is in Gehenna, it's for a maximum of 12 months, which we go out of our cave. They hear a prophetic voice, go out of your cave. They go out, and again, they see people dealing with worldly matters. And every time Rabbi Elazar, the son, would see it, the person would get sick, and then Rabbi Shimon would look at him, and he'd get healed again. These remarkable people with tremendous powers. They got out, it was the Erev Shabbos, the day before Shabbos, and they see someone rushing home with two flowers. And they say to him, well, why do you have two flowers? He says, well, Shabbos. He says, yeah, but why, why do you need two? What's wrong with just one? Two, we have two bundles of myrtles, we call flowers. Well, what, 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 why do you need two? He says, well, one of them is for Zohar, to remember Shabbos, and one of them is for Shomer, to guard Shabbos. They were so moved that people still had a sensitivity for Torah and for mitzvos. They said, okay, there's something left uh, to redeem, some redeemable quality of this world. After that, they it happened to have been walking in the marketplaces. They happened to have encountered that same traitor that betrayed them to the Romans. Rabbi Shimon said, this guy is still around? He looked at him, and the guy became a pile of bones. Rabbi, Rabbi Shimon, we'll see from the rest of the stories, he, he was a very sharp person, and like I said, had zero tolerance for anything that was not Torah, and evil stood no chance. If there was evil next to him, it would just get consumed. It was just, it had, it had no continuity. Uh, now, during this time period in the cave, like we said, he wrote the Zohar. What's the Zohar? The Zohar is the foundational book of Kabbalah. Kabbalah is Jewish mysticism. It's essentially a Aramaic commentary on the Torah. It has absolute dizzying complexity and very elusive understanding. Uh, during that period, he was engaged in very deep Torah matters, and afterwards he wrote it. Now, this book was passed on, but it was never publicized. We'll see when we learn about the Oral Torah that there's certain elements of the Oral Torah that were publicized 50 years later, but the hidden parts of the Torah, the Kabbalah, that was not publicized, and was only passed down from teacher to student over the course of about a thousand years. In the 13th century, a Spanish Jew by the name of Moshe de Leon, he found the book, or he encountered the book, it's not clear, and he publicized it leading many secular scholars to claim that he indeed was the real author and he was just attributing it back to Rabbi Shimon in order to get uh, the book sales. It's kind of like when J.K. Rowling, when she uh, wrote another book that wasn't Harry Potter, it didn't sell, it sold like 300 copies. Then she's like, oh, she let it leak that she's actually the author and right away jumped to the number one New York Times bestseller. That's what he wanted. Who, who was he? Moshe the young, some guy. And he says, oh, it's from Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai, and people believe it. That's what the cynics claim. Now, I don't want to get involved too much in that debate of the authenticity of the book. Clearly, according to Jewish tradition, and according to people that really have studied it and understand these matters, it was the work of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai. Secular historians claim otherwise. Irrespective of that, it's a book of tremendous depth and spirituality. 
it seems very unlikely that someone of the caliber of, Rabbi, of Moshe de Leon would write it himself. And also there was a tradition from time immemorial that Rabbi Shemar had written some book and it was in the hands, but it wasn't public, uh, publicly available. Additionally, uh, this is a big discussion as to the authorship of the Zohar. We believe, like I said, it's from Rabbi Shemar There's a lot of evidence to support that. For example, the Rambam quotes the Zohar even though the Rambam preceded Moshe de Leon, and he does quote something that only appears in the Zohar. So how did he have it if it was written 200 years after he died? Well, that's a good question. Either way, this is what we assume. It was written by him, uh, and we still have a connection to his Torah and to what was going on for those 13 years in the cave. So let's talk a little bit about these miracles that he did. So we see already he's able, he has a, a power to him to be able to do miracles. When he gets out of the cave, he had dermatological maladies from spending all the time in the sand, and a miracle happened, and he got healed. And he said, oh, a miracle happened to me? I'm going to do a miracle for everyone else. So he said, okay, well, is there anything the community needs? So the community of Tiberias had a problem, because there were a lot of dead bodies, and the halacha is, if there's a dead body, a Kohen cannot walk over a gravesite. So the Kohens, they, didn't, they had a hard time navigating the city because everywhere there was so much war and people were buried so hastily. You didn't know. It wasn't exactly the word in clear markers where there were dead people. He says, that's a problem. That's a problem that the community needed. He says, oh, I'll take care of that. He does some prayer or whatever he did and all the bodies flow to the top. They quickly mark out where all the bodies are and he solves that problem. But that's like one of the small miracles that he did. Another, another story here. He taught Torah to, publicly to his students and he once had a student that left Israel. And he went, he went and became a businessman who probably went to Asia, made a lot of money. And he came back, and he's this really rich guy. And you know, all students are looking at him. If only we went, to Is- we went out of Israel, we went to Chutz Laaretz, and we would also be wealthy. So he could sense with his students that they too wanted to do the same. So he takes them out to a valley next to where he was living in Meron in northern Israel. And he started praying. And he says, Valley, valley, I command you to fill up with gold dinars. And before you know it, crashing down from all sides are piles and piles of gold. And he tells the students, okay, you want gold? Here's your gold. If this is looking aside from Torah study, do it. But you should know, if you take the gold now, and you get to Lama Ba, you don't have any gold. And, of course, the students got scared. You know, you don't want to start out like, and they just left the gold there. But he taught them a very powerful lesson. And this was his perspective. His perspective was, we're living for Lama Ba. We're here. This is only temporary. This is the corridor over here before the next world. That's what it's about. And we have to work here to invest in our high olam, in our permanent life. And he sees people working on temporary life. It's insane. How is it possible that someone could neglect their permanent life and invest instead in the temporary life. It doesn't seem to be logical at all. We have an opportunity in every house of scholarship to pick up gold. There's gold available for us wherever we want. But it's eternal gold, worth even more. Yet, the Yetzirah deludes us into thinking that we should be pursuing the material gold. And it's so illogical, and Rabbi Shim didn't get that. He didn't get it. It didn't make any sense to him. Don't waste your time here with nonsense. Now, another thing that the community needed was to officially rescind the decrees of Hadrian. While Hadrian had passed and the emperors that came subsequently were more hospitable to the Jews, there was still an official edict of intolerance against the Jewish people that was still in Rome, in in the archives, so to speak. So they said, "We, we need to send people, we need to send someone to go there. The problem is you're going to Rome, you're walking into the lion's den. You know? So he said, okay, who should go? They sat down all the rabbis, who should go? He says, oh, let Rabbi Shimon go. Why? Rabbi Shimon, he's used to doing miracles. We need a miracle. He's the right guy to send. But he shouldn't go alone, who should go with him? So they suggested, Rabbi Yossi was one of the other rabbis, he had a son of Rabbi Eliezer, send him along as well. So Rabbi Yossi, who's Rabbi Shimon's colleague, he recognizes now that his son has been nominated to go be the traveling companion of Rabbi Shimon. And he says, not my kid. 
It's like, I don't want him to die. And Rosh says, wait a minute, I'm willing to go, so I'm willing to die. Why should you not be willing to send your kid? So Rabbi Yossi tells him, no, I'm not scared of the Romans, I'm scared of you. I'm scared that you'll get upset at him for some reason. You'll look at him and he'll turn into a pile of bones. Or who knows what's going to happen to him. You have a history. He says, okay, I'm promising you that I'm not going to do anything to him. I'm not going to punish him. Fine. They're traveling to Rome. Along the way, two great scholars are coming from Jerusalem. All the Jews are coming to meet them. And one of the people comes and asks the rabbi, so I have a question. What's the halacha? What's certain halacha? They ask him a question of halacha. Now, the rule is if there's two rabbis and you ask a Torah question, the younger rabbi has to defer to the older rabbi. So, the young rabbi Elazar, the son of Rabbi Yossi, who's traveling for Rabbi Shimon, he says to him, like kind of whispers down like this, it's okay, you know, he kind of gives him the answer. And Rabbi Shimon picks up that this guy answered the question and didn't defer. So, right away, I realize, he says, I, 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 I could tell that you answered, and you didn't defer to my honor. I'm, I'm saying right now that, you're, that you, the son, should not go back to the father. And right away he gets ill. And the conclusion of the story is, is better, because he, he, he's ill, and he's writhing in pain. And he tells him, but don't you remember what you told my father? The next time he says, oh, I remembered. He prayed, and he got better. But this really shows that he had a certain power. And it's, the idea behind it is that we are subject to nature. Nature controls us. If someone's going to get ill, if someone, due to natural causes, will get ill, they'll get ill. We, we are subject to nature. But when someone has Torah to such a degree, nature becomes subject to them. That's the rule. Rabbi Shimon, all he did was Torah. All he did was Torah. Therefore, he had Torah. Torah is the blueprints for the world. Therefore, he was a step higher in the pecking order. Nature was beholden, was subjugated to him, and therefore he could do with it whatever he wanted. He was almost as if he had the status of someone higher in the chain of command. He wasn't subject to nature. Nature was subject to him. So they're heading to Rome to try to rescind the decree of Hadrian, and they get a, another traveler. Who is this traveler? This is some sort of demon of sorts. And he says, the demon comes to them and says to them, Rabbis, you guys need some help. Would you like me to come join with you? He said, yeah, sure, come help us along the way. <laughs> First, Rabbi Shimon starts crying. He says, Hagar, we read, we read it in Genesis, Hagar, when she needed help, who came, up, who came to help her? Three angels came to help her. To me, I need help, and all I have this, this Nebuch demon. This, this is who's helping me. He was lamenting the fact that all he had was demons helping him, not like real full-fledged angels. I guess we take either one. Either way, the demon runs ahead to Rome. He inserts himself into the body of the daughter of the Caesar. And the Caesar's daughter, he causes the Caesar's daughter to go crazy and to just start screaming, give me Rabbi Shimon Merchai, need Rabbi Shimon Merchai, need Rabbi Shimon Merchai to help me. He gets to Rome. Everyone's looking for Rabbi Shimon Merchai. He says, well, here I am. He goes to the daughter. He instructs this Bentimlion, this demon, to, to leave. Right away, the demon leaves. And all the Romans are absolutely, you know, struck by this man, Rabbi Shimon Baruchai. And they said to him, take whatever you want. So they bring him into the, uh, into the storehouses of all the wealth and all the gold and everything. He says, take whatever, anything you want is yours because you saved the Caesar's daughter. He finds that little note, says, all I want is this. Sure. He rips it up and he heads back to Israel. Now, there's a few teachings about him that really show the kind of extent of his piety. Uh, for example, we're told in the Talmud that Rabbi Shemu Bar Yechai himself, he could, have, he could have absolved everyone from the beginning of his life until that point. Him and his son from the beginning of time until that point. And he says, if I had me, my son, and this other rabbi, then we could absolve all the people that have, that have ever lived or will ever live. Not only that, the Talmud says about him, that people that were growers, people that, that were ascenders, so to speak, people that were always growing spiritually, if there's a thousand people in history that are like that, Rabbi Shimon and his son are amongst them. If there's a hundred people like that, Rabbi Shimon and his son are amongst that. And he says if there's only two of them, it's Rabbi Shimon and his son. These people were dramatic, sensational, legendary scholars and leaders and people of great piety.
Additionally, the Talmud tells us whenever there is a rainbow, it's a sign of, it's a bad sign. It means the Almighty wants to destroy the world. However, during the entire lifetime of Rabbi Shimon, not a single rainbow ever appeared. Why? Because the Almighty was happy. When, 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 when Rabbi Shimon exists in the world, just that one man, that's enough to keep the whole world meritorious. Now, there's a very heartwarming story about Rabbi Shimon as well. It, he sounds like a, very, a little bit of a tough personality, someone who is very uncompromising and unyielding, which he was, certainly with respect to Torah, but he had a very sensitive elements to him as well. So there's a story once, a couple, they were married for a long time and they didn't have any children. And Allah is, if, they, people, the couple, if they're both infertile or one of them is infertile, then it's appropriate under certain circumstances them to divorce just so they should have the opportunity to fulfill the mitzvah of procreation. So they came to Rabbi Shimon, he's the rabbi, and he's going to officiate their divorce. And he sees that they still love each other, and it's still very positive. So what does he do? He says, I said, listen, I'll do the divorce, but I see you guys still love each other. And when you got married, it was done, you were singing and dancing and, and music and, and food. If you're going to divorce, you have to do it the same way. So make a big party, divorce party, everyone's invited, right? So probably strange looking uh, instructions to the, to the person who made the invitations, right? What? I've never done that before. So they make a huge party, a festive party of divorce. The husband gets drunk and he tells the wife, he says, listen, I love you. We're getting divorced now. You go to my house, take anything you want, it's yours. And he goes to sleep, he's sleeping, and he's in a stupor, fine. She tells her people, you see my husband now, he's in the bed? Lift him up and take him with me, I'm taking him home. So she goes back to her father's home, and they're holding, lugging her husband, who's, they're getting divorced, right? Lugging her alone, alongside them. They put him there, they deposit him in the house, and he's sleeping, he's totally <coughs> drunk. He wakes up and he's like, where, where am I? He realizes he's by his in-law's house. He's like, what's going on over here? I went to sleep in my house. How drunk was I? And she tells him, listen, you told me to take whatever I want with me when I go home. And I said, oh, this is what I want. I still want you. So they were moved by the story. They went back to Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi says, why don't you guys get back together? He prayed for them and she conceived and they had a baby. Uh, Rabbi Shimon was someone, uh, there's an incredible amount of teachings in the Talmud from him. He's one of the foundational contributors to the Talmud, to the Mishnah. I want to select a few teachings that he had. Uh, he said, for example, when Moshe came down from the mountain, his face was glowing, and the people were terrified of him. Says Rabbi Shimon, come and see the absolute devastating effects of sin. Beforehand, mere 40 days beforehand, the Jewish people were not watching Moses, they were watching God, they had prophecy, and they were unfazed. And now they're sitting in the golden calf, and they couldn't even bear the sight of Moses. Just an incredible biting criticism of showing, not criticism, but really showing the after effects of, of sin. You sin and your spiritual stature right away tanks. For example, he said, furthermore, he said, anyone that has any degree of arrogance, it's like they do idolatry. What does it mean for someone to be prideful, to be arrogant? It means for them to say, to believe that what they have is theirs. They earned it. And they earned it and God didn't contribute because if God contributed, if they're created, they're not creators, well, then there's no reason to be prideful or arrogant. Says Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, if someone is at all prideful, that is akin to idolatry. It's the same thing. When someone bows down to a foreign god, that's the same thing as someone saying, look at me, look how great I am. Both of them are rejecting God. Another famous Gemara, there's, there's thousands, I just selected a few. The Talmud asked the question of Abraham studying Torah. We know that the tradition says, and it's evident in the text as well, that Abraham studied Torah before it was even given. How did Abraham study Torah? Says Rabbi Yishim Bar Yichai, his two kidneys became like two jugs of water that were overwhelming, over wellsprings of Torah. 
what he says, which, which really is a, is a strange imagery, of course, but there's a deep lesson here. Rabbi Shimon is saying that we all have Torah within us. We have Torah within us. And it's possible to access it if we're able to dig deep into ourselves. The only reason why we cannot access the Torah is because we have a Yetzirah. You defeat the Yetzirah, and you could uncover the powers that you have within. Rabbi Shimon is someone who lived with his perspective of trying to really access the potential that we have. For a lot of people, they maybe could have become great as well, as not as great as Rabbi Shimon, but maybe they were contemporaries that could have become great as Rabbi Shimon, but they didn't have this feeling, this drive, this ambition and aspiration to say, I'm going to do everything that I can, I'm going to untap the wellsprings of Torah from within. Rabbi Shimon lived with that perspective. He says, I have Torah within me as well. We all have Torah within us. Well, what am I going to do? Am I going to waste my time with all the nonsense, with chasing the money, with living, with farming? Why would I waste my time with farming? God will take care of me. God, God's my, my billionaire dad. Why should I worry? If, if your dad's a billionaire, you're going to go and start turning over the land to try to pull out some, some turnips? It's insane. God's your, if, if God is your billionaire dad, what do you have to worry about? That was his perspective, and he really lived by that. Now, he died on the 33rd day of the Omer. This day essentially became a day uh, of a holiday, Lagba Omer, which is the day that, where we celebrate the Torah of Rabbi Shimon and the hidden secrets of Torah, the traditions, of course, of bonfires and studying his works. In his gravesite in Meron in northern Israel, it's a, a pil- pilgrimage, it's, well, it's a festival where people go there every Lagba Omer. In fact, this past year, more than a half a million people visit Meron during the week of the what's known as the Hilula, the day of the days of celebration. And it's really interesting. There's a tremendous parallel between the world that we have and the world that he emerged in. We could perhaps say that the first Holocaust that Jewish people experienced was the Holocaust of Hadrian. It was the same thing. It too was a time where the continuity and perpetuity of the Jewish people was very much in doubt. People were being slaughtered indiscriminately. Torah was being disrupted. Torah leaders were being assassinated. Who is to say the Jewish people will continue? All the great leaders of, of yesteryear are being, are, are being killed every day. How are we going to ensure survival? We meet someone like Rabbi Shimon who had absolutely zero tolerance and uncompromising commitment to Torah. And he contributed along with his colleagues to once again bring the glory back to the Jewish people. In our times, we also suffered a Holocaust. And we also suffered tremendous upheaval and dispersal and Torah uh, disruption. All the great leaders, all the great yeshivas, everything was disrupted. Our nation is once again being drawn to to Rabbi Shimon and to his Torah. And really what he represented, the idea that we're here as a nation on a mission. We cannot waste our time with what's known as Chaye Shah, which is temporary life. We have to focus on permanent life. Focus on Torah. You're going to spend the whole time. The, during the planting season, you're going to plant. During the plowing season, you're going to plow. During the time for harvesting, you're going to harvest and grind and, and, and winnow. When, what about Torah? What about life? What about what it's really about? All that, you're going to forget. What do you do? Study Torah. Study Torah. And who's going to feed my family? Leave that to God. God's a billionaire dad. If you really believe it, it'll actually happen. Now, as a caveat, I'm not advising people to quit their job right now. But maybe Rabbi Shimon would. Because Rabbi Shimon had that sensitivity. He says he really legitimately, literally felt what he believed. He lived by it. And as a result, evil had no... There was, he was stronger than evil. He had the reins of nature were given to him. And that's why he was able to, to really promote a new generation and a new resurgence, a new renaissance of Torah that saved the Jewish people, him along with his colleagues, and brought about uh, a stabilization of Torah. He laid the groundwork for writing the oral Torah, which would almost give us a, a certain security blanket. Because once we have the oral Torah, we have something that's transportable People could study by themselves as well. And if not for him and his friends, we would not be around today. One of the greatest of the students of Rabbi Akiva, one of the teachers of the next generation of Torah scholars. And next week, 
we will meet another one of the five students of Rabbi Akiva, one of those people that were also given the smicha uh, clandestinely by Rabbi Yehuda Mambava, and also in his own way contributed to the resurgence of Torah in the second century.